Welcome to this Silvera virtual fireside chat about COP26, Article 6, and what it means for the voluntary carbon markets. I'm Ben Rattenbury, I'm Head of Policy at Silvera, and I'll be hosting today's uh, conversation. It seems like only yesterday, but it's now actually two weeks since COP26 concluded. So now that the dust has settled, and those who were there have hopefully recovered, and also the market is starting to react, we thought it the perfect time to take stock. We're lucky to have gathered some of the leading experts in their fields to discuss what the Article 6 outcome means across four key areas, policy, the market, the buyers, and ratings. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Natalie Flores from the Dominican Republic's Environment Ministry, Rene Velasquez from CBL, Stephanie Zhu from Delta Airlines, and Sam Gill from Silvera. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having us. So th thanks all very much for joining. So the first question is more of a personal reflection, and I know that not everyone was able to actually uh, attend the COP in Glasgow, but just briefly, what was COP like for you? Sam, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, COP was a bit of a blur for me. It was an exceptionally busy time, but I think, you know, it was really nice to meet in the flesh people that I've been working with now for, you know, 18 months, almost two years, uh, virtually. Um, and, 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 you know, COVID's meant that we actually haven't been able to meet in person. I think one of the really uh, nice aspects of COP was actually just, you know, meeting all of these fantastic, passionate um, people who, who, who work in this space in the flesh and, and being able to sort of collaborate and, and discuss in person. Um, I think one of the, 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 the things that also stood out to me was um, how re well represented the private sector was at this COP. And I think for many people that was presented uh, you know, to the press, uh, by the press as a, as a negative. But actually, in reality, what that means is the private sector, that markets are starting to galvanise, they're starting to take action, and they're taking this seriously as an issue. Um, and I think that's a really exciting thing. And I think, you know, when I take a stand back, many people say, look, this COP didn't deliver what it needed to. I think in reality, in, in public sector terms, it actually made quite a lot of progress and moved quickly. But I think we're all aware we need to move a lot faster and markets have the capability to do that. So I think for me, you know, it was great to meet pe people in real life, um, to collaborate, um, to, to share ideas and exchange. But I think it was also really exciting to see the private sector out in force and, and trying to really drive, drive the agenda. Thanks, Sam. Stephanie, how about you? How was your call? Yeah, um, I will agree with everything that Sam said, uh, especially having met three of the people on this panel um, at COP for the very first time. Um, and I think for us, it, it was all for us and for Delta and myself, my first time at COP. Um, and so it was a lot to take in. It was very overwhelming, but it was interesting to see that it was almost like two different events, so to speak. Um, so one being, you know, the actual negotiations around Article 6 and the Glasgow Agreement. Um, and then also, you know, what Sam said, just private sector really having these separate events, talking, you know, amongst each other on how we can really scale and do things quicker and sort of align with what's happening um, in the, more of the traditional COP negotiations. So I think it was very interesting, um, a lot to kind of take in to keep up with what was going on with Article 6 every day and also sort of to keep up with everybody that was there, you know, meetings to Sam's point, we hadn't seen a lot of the people within the carbon markets, within the aviation sector for almost two years, just to talk about everything that has happened, how we in the sector, we in carbon markets, um, and we working with governments, we're trying to push things forward. So I feel like a lot was able to happen. Um, and I think it was a great experience. Great, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Natalie, how about you? How was your COP experience? Well, for me, it was a little bit different because um, I've been a negotiator for, for about 10 years now. Um, I started very young this journey. So before I was very, very technical at some level. So now um, I'm holding the title of climate change director. So um, for me, what's, what's challenging because this is my convention, like at the Ministry of Environment, we have uh, like about, I don't know, 30 cups from different topics from whales to um, 
sustainability in general, like Rio Plus 20. We have to, uh, to also work on the, the certification convention and other UN conventions that I could spend the whole day mentioning. Um, so this one was like, uh, I was in charge of this one. So I have first coordinate uh, our inter internal um, delegation for the Ministry of Environment. Our president unfortunately couldn't come to the World Leaders Summit. So um, the Minister of Environment has to take over. So I have to support him as well. And then we have to sit at the table of the negotiations under his leadership. Putting into perspective, of, of course, their priorities of the Dominican Republic. Why was it different this time? Because um, this is a new government, it's a new administration. We've been uh, into uh, in office for one year. So it was the first time that this new administration was going to COP. So it was challenging at the same time to go through the whole process with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, other ministries of our country that has to do with development, energy, among other sectors, and of course the interest of the private sector. So um, due to COVID, we were asked by uh, the president of the COP to have like a small uh, delegation, which we try we try to stick to due to you know the COVID bubble into the negotiations rooms and everything. But I think as Dominican Republic overall, we delivered. Our main goal was to position our country as an emerging climate leader because we are ge geographically like very well connected. And at the same time, we are, let's say, challenging our private sector to go further. Like you have to change from, from a social corporate responsibility and you need to start investing. So that's like, that, that was our main goal. And of course, financing for our like small developing states. We try like to speak up and raise our voice in the different negotiations group that we are part of as Dominican Republic so that we can position the country to, to go further. And um, that's like, let's say, the first impression of the COP as overall for our country. Thanks, Natalie, that's, that's a great summary. And last but not least, Rene, how is your COP? <laughs> Thanks, Ben. So I, I, I'm the odd man out here. I, I didn't actually attend the COP because I had the flu and I didn't want to be a super spreader at the event. Um, so I stayed home, so my, my COP was, relatively quiet compared to the other panelists but but I have I guess a different perspective because <clears throat> effectively I wasn't there and I saw the hive of activity going on just in, through social media channels and through the dialogue and conversations of many folks that were there my peers who 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 I saw just incredibly motivated by what both Sam and, and, and Steph and, and Natalie just mentioned this kind of a wave of, um, of activity that, that was evidenced not only in the policy realm, but also in the private sector. And effectively, to me, it, 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 it kind of, the outcome, whilst not perfect, was very, very good. It was a lot more than many people had expected going in into the COP in terms of the Article 6 rulebook being finalised and now an understanding around the, the Paris mechanism. Um, and, and, you know, things like corresponding adjustments, the ITMOs, et cetera, which we were all really hoping for that policy signal. And to me, it really brought home that, that traditional kind of economics 101, where essentially this, you know, good policies and having the policy tailwind allows the markets to really harness the competitive um, you know, advantages and innovation and really to help to spur greater activity and to ultimately meet the, the ambitions that are being set by co corporate leaders like, like Delta Airlines um, on, on this panel. Uh, and, and essentially, it's being able to harness the power of markets. And I think that one of the things that I saw going into COP was really this positive um, notion and feeling in the marketplace as evidenced by the price and, and the volume action on the voluntary platforms like, like CBL, um, prior, two, two to three weeks prior to COP, we just saw this very bullish sentiment going into COP and then ultimately being vindicated as a result of those policy outcomes. And, and it's really interesting to see that, that now all of the mechanics are, are really working well together, policymakers, financial markets, investment, corporates making commitments. And so it, it just it felt like everything was falling into place. Uh, whereas in previous COPs, like I remember the, the Copenhagen COP, Maybe Paris was different because there was a lot of optimism as well, but in, it certainly this time around just felt like the optimi optimism was just overwhelming, which was fantastic. And I'm really sad I missed it. 
That's really interesting. Thanks all for your reflections. And actually, I'd, I'd like to pick up, Renee, on what you were just saying, because I, I'd like to spend a few minutes now for us each to think about what the COP means in our specific areas. And Renee, you just touched on this, but it'd be great if you could maybe go into a bit more depth on what you think the Article 6 outcome will mean for the markets. Yeah, it's a great question. I think to, to be very upfront, I, I think the market is still trying to digest the kind of, see, kind of policy impacts um, for voluntary carbon, in particular issues around corresponding adjustments. There seems to be uh, effectively still some discussions around what are what are the meanings of certain you know language within the actual um you know published texts at the cop um we were advised by the the chief negotiator at the unf triple c on a, on, a, on a recent aida call uh, her lady's name is, is amy steen not to do not to dig too deep into the into the uh underlying meaning of every single word because effectively uh, of the nature of, of the negotiations um, some of those were replaced in multiple times and ultimately you know finalized and so um, but but many many actors are still kind of trying to digest what are the impacts for voluntary carbon offsets as it relates to things like corresponding adjustments what what seems to be the conclusion and the understanding of most is that corresponding adjustments so, so the accounting kind of nomenclature around moving and allocating the, the uh, emission reductions and the benefits to, to a country's ledger certainly apply in the case of the Article 6.2 and 6.4 for the ITMOs and then the Paris, 6, um, Paris Mechanism Instruments, essentially like the, the, the next generation of CDM, and for compliance systems like Corsia. But the question mark is the, the question around other in, in that definition in, in, in the Article 6 um, uh, language. And many proponents in the voluntary market see that there really is no need for that corresponding adjustment for substantiating purely voluntary claims, because essentially you're not moving the units from one country to another country where the corporate is domiciled. And so I think that there'll be some time to digest this. I think that the standards certainly will continue to make in, in, in the private context, like the BCS and gold standard will continue to put out guidance around how they interpret it. But essentially you'll have two tracks, one for voluntary offsets with corresponding adjustments and those without them. And we'll see where the market really tends to go. What does the adoption look like from a corporate making commitments? I, I suspect some corporates will want and need corresponding adjustments for a certain subset of, of offsets. So for example, um, and I'd love to get Stephanie's view on this is, you know, obviously it seems that for Corsia eligible offsets, there will be a requirement for those corresponding adjustments. So that'll create essentially a, a smaller pool of liquidity that will, I think will have an effect on pricing, but that's, that's certainly known. Will voluntary buyers be looking for corresponding adjustments for purely voluntary offsets? And if the answer is yes, then I think that that will kind of gravitate and, and, and kind of take the market down that direction. I suspect that it's no. And I suspect that voluntary buyers will, will essentially look to finance projects through the, through the process of acquiring those offsets uh, in areas where they can make significant impacts. And I think it'll be the countries that choose not to require corresponding adjustments for those volunteer activities in their countries that will be really successful in attracting that private um, financing to come in and, and spur those emission reductions at scale. Um, and, and whereas maybe some others don't. And so you'll see this kind of divergence and that will be really interesting to see. But the overall thematic kind of trend that we see in the market is that the demand is not going away. Um, that the demand is consistent and it's effectively buoyed by the tailwinds of policy direction, increasing uh, investor and shareholder pressures, societal pressures, and that decarbonization is, is a, is a long-term mega trend. And it's, and it's now going to be the biggest transformation in terms of like geopolitics and economy, economics um, ever, right? It, greater than the industrial revolution. So that, that holds is bolted. And I think that that is the, the key direction to drive. Now the question is, can supply keep up with the demand, right? And, and, and we're yet to be seen. Um, so ultimately I see in summary, article six kind of corresponding adjustments, maybe being, um, bottlenecks in some in certain parts in terms of the supply constraints and that that may have disproportionate effects in terms of pricing and and that will be an interesting thing to watch so hopefully Thanks, hopefully that, that's not that's not too much to digest no no that that's brilliant that's really interesting thank you it's great insights particularly for someone who, who knows this market inside out and um yeah there's definitely been talk about a, a split in the market of the vcm 
on the one hand, uh, credits with corresponding adjustments, and on the other, credits without. And you mentioned Coursera um, requiring corresponding adjustments, even though no one quite knows how this will work in practice yet because the accounting mechanisms haven't yet been created. But Stephanie, I think this is a, a lovely segue to uh, invite you into the conversation. Um, as well as referencing Coursera, Renee also mentioned Tailwinds, which is, of course, music to, to your ears <laughs> working in airline because that means lower fuel consumption and uh, the travel time which everyone likes. So Stephanie, uh, along those lines, could you say a bit about what you think the Article 6 outcome means uh, for you and your role and how this might impact your strategy going forward? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think I agree with, I think, everything that Renee talked about. Um, so for us, it's really thinking through, you know, we have a goal that is carbon neutrality from March 2020 going forward. So we have been purchasing offsets. Uh, we work through, you know, a lot of different partners that we've talked about, you know, ultimately investing in the carbon market and buying carbon offsets in the short term is because we need to make an impact on climate now. We're not, you know, stopping all the other things to your point on tailwinds or reducing fuel. That all needs to come to decarbonize aviation. But for right now, um, we need to look at things like how to end deforestation or stop deforestation by 2030. And the lever that we can use currently is carbon offsets. We buy a lot of this um, and there's going to be a part of our portfolio that obviously is needs to be Corsia eligible in order to meet our Corsia obligation um, over the next 15 years. And then there's another part of it that I guess really falls under the voluntary portion um, in order for us to meet carbon neutrality. And I think where the article six comes in will really be understanding do there be, is there going to be a need for corresponding adjustments? And do we ultimately buy, do we ultimately do corresponding adjustments for just Corsia eligible and then not for the rest of the portfolio? Um, and I think this is really great as we're thinking about what we're going to be do, doing for the next three to five years, understanding what those impacts are. Um, and then just thinking about how that's gonna ultimately impact where we invest our money to really scale preventing deforestation, you know, where um, these funds really need to go to make um, ultimate impact in the short term. I think one other thing that I will touch on just as, you know, we've been in this space a relatively long time, I think purchasing in much smaller scales before, but I think really for corporate buyers, that are going to be coming into the space to meet their net zero targets or carbon neutrality targets or to be able to be on this journey um, along carbon, I think it's really important to have transparency and for these people within companies like myself that may not be carbon traders day to day to help understand all of the nuances around Article 6, you know, what has to be done if you're going on one track, if you are doing course eligible and you're an airline, what has to happen? So I think um, we kind of talked about this a little bit at COP also, but we're not all carbon traders and there's a lot of nuance in this. So I think just transparency, vis visibility and understanding kind of what has to happen in order for us to be able to finance these projects will be I think really critical in the next couple months and year. That's great. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Natalie, obviously you mentioned that you were in the heart of the negotiations, so really kind of in, in the thick of it here. Could you say a bit about how you think the COP26 outcome has landed in the policy community? Okay, so um, we have a lot of, let's say, um, encounter views because um, all of our countries has uh, have you know, different interests. Um, we put so much effort in uh, bringing Article 6 and out of this cup, like this is what we wanted. Though, of course, um, and I don't want to sound, you know, not politically correct, but um, the usual players um, play the, their card. Uh, we were fighting until the end, especially to avoid um, double accounting. I know the private sector and entities like those represented here, like Pansive, CDL, like Silvera, Delta, which is uh, also a company, right? Have been putting so much effort together to actually make the balance needed to stick to 1.5 and of course make the balance we need to avoid double accounting, 
but um, we were very afraid that we were actually getting into like a road of a possible double accounting. Um, most of the negotiations group that the Dominican Republic is part of and other neg negotiations group that we are not even part of um, were worried as we were, especially because um, forestry issues are a priority for us. And we were like having this conversation, like if you are allowing CDM credits into the Paris rule book, you should allow also, you know, the work that small developing states have been doing in protecting their forests to try to make this balance because forestry, it's supposed to be like the cheapest way to fight climate change, right? So we were, making this little fight which was priority for us it was important but it, it was not like the pushback of the agreement itself like it was even uh, more deep in the way in which that like, the agreement was put forward so as as i mentioned before uh for us i have i have to say this on behalf of my country like we were a bit disappointed because we have um about I don't know, 12, 13 years, trying to put together readiness, preparation, and preparation to access to this benefit of result based pay payments, and then being able to do some program like the program that perhaps Delta does, and we haven't been able to do that. You know what I mean? So right now, in our view, uh, in that specific part, just to give you an example, how like our conversations during the negotiations were, and of course, you know, this is um, this is diplomacy. This is this is very political. Uh, when leaders sit together, um, we at technical level we advise them, but at the end, you know, if you want an agreement, if you want like a result and a, and at least set a basis, we have, let's say, to. Uh, let go some of our our not priorities but fight our priorities later um in our case also uh finance was was an important issue finance in general and that's why we were we were like in the negotiations group we are part of because you know this is a consensus um this is a consensus convention so we had to try to make our voice through the negotiations group that we are part of so we we were very keen on finance for adaptation. So we were like, if you are going to finance um, through the Green Climate Fund, for example, um, mitigation actions, and you are going to fund um, electric vehicles, you, you are going to fund wind farms and everything, like what will we do with the investment that countries like mine need to do on adaptation? So we wanted to link uh, we wanted to make the link between Article 6 and funding for adaptation as well. And um, at some point, we were very like uh, positive on the outcome of that, but later we were a little let down, you know. And at the end, we we uh, accepted the text as, as it was in order like to reach consensus between countries. But um, we haven't given up on our priorities and we are very looking forward to keep improving uh, text and these rules um, as part of the negotiations process. But I think it's very important, like the role that players like all of you here uh, do, you know, in this, because having, having the interest of our private sector, though, uh, Delta is not private sector of the Dominican Republic, but has more than nine flights a day between the Dominican Republic, uh, be between, for example, Santo Domingo and New York. So I can say like Delta has sort of interest in our country because most of the Dominicans fly in Delta to New York, just to give an example. So having these players there and telling us, look, this is priority for me. This is what your country needs to head because this is the way I can help you reach your 20% of reduction that you want to do through your NDC and transportation through aviation is one of your um, of your uh, um, 
mitigation actions typified in your NDC. So I'm here and this is my priority. So I think that this was an interesting cop because of that, like private sector was really engaged, private sector was really following up with their government, but it was smooth. It's like, this is my research, this is what I've done, this is what I can do. So take this as, as an advice. So we were, that's what we were trying to do, like to play, you know, all the cards in our priorities and the priorities for, for, for our country. So in general, we were a bit disappointed because of course, like the real priorities of our country on loss and damages as a small island state and adaptation were not reached as we expected. We got some stuff for adaptation, but not like the fights that we did until the end. Like we were there negotiating until Sunday, until the last call. So um, uh, yeah, I think we can keep improving and we, we will keep doing it and we will push you to, to you know, have the Dominican Republic in this precise moment with, uh, to take like that leap, that next step that we need to take now that the Paris rule book is uh, advanced and, and finished. That's great. Thank you so much, Natalie, for those insights. And I should also say, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your efforts in the negotiations, because it really was a, a tireless and a, a very grueling effort. I know there were a lot of extremely late nights during the, the period that you were in Glasgow, and it's, it's wonderful news all around that there was a successful conclusion after so many years of trying on Article 6. So, so thank you for your, for your efforts. And of course, nobody thinks it's a perfect deal. Everybody had to compromise. And like you said, this is a, um, a big milestone, but hopefully it can improve year on year. Um, onwards to COP27 and beyond. Just to conclude this, this round of, um, of discussion, Sam, could you say a few words about what you think the Article 6 conclusions means for project quality? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, when we think about project quality, you know, obviously that, that's our job. We, we, we systematically assess project quality. And what we see is that's a, a general trend in the, in the newer projects. Uh, towards towards quality. So there's been a, a huge amount of innovation in, in the voluntary sector, in the voluntary carbon market around these methodologies that are used to generate credits. Um, and I see uh, the Article 6 uh, outcome as basically supporting that, that trend towards innovation and, and trend towards quality. And I think, you know, if you look, the backdrop to these discussions are, even if you look in the voluntary carbon markets, there's a trend towards more and more safety involvement in the issuance of credits. If you look at uh, the, the jurisdictional nested red programs, for example, there's this, this, this trend to uh, pushing the accounting up at the, at the national level and then nesting projects into it. So I think uh, the signals we're seeing around corresponding adjustments is just going to be pushing that trend even further. And I think that, that can only be a good thing to see more and more engagement from at the national level um, in, in the sector, because you, you, you want governments to be really engaged in, in the the, uh, the possibilities uh, that, that, that the market are able to open, open up in terms of financing. So I see it as a really positive outcome there. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the Article 6.4 6 mechanism, I think I'm generally very positive that any methodologies that come out of that mechanism will be stronger than the CDM ones and will build on the, the innovations that have been made in the voluntary sector between the CDM days and, and, and now. Um, but I think more generally, Glasgow sends a very strong signal around quality, that quality is only going to prove that it's expected uh, that both nation states and the private sector deeply care about quality. Um, and I, I think that that's something that's not going away. That, that's, that's definitely growing. That, that, for me, that's a huge positive. That's great. Thanks very much, Sam. I'd like to build a bit on the idea of quality and particularly this idea of co-benefits because we heard a lot in Glasgow about the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, I think much more than many previous COPs. So I'd briefly like to ask Natalie and then Sam. So given this increased focus on indigenous peoples and local communities uh, within the voluntary carbon markets, do you see this as having an impact in the coming months and years ahead? Natalie, would you like to kick us off? Sorry, um, I was I was a little distracted reading <laughs> our agenda. Um, well, the years to come, um, I'm, I'm going to take an example again, my country. So you um, you can put it in perspective because of course um, I'm a governmental representative and 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 this is what we have to do. For us, I think it's it's uh, it's going to be a lot of work because we need to change 
let's say the mindset, we need to educate our private sector in our rules, in, in the rules that we have put into place. We have to go beyond um, the institutional arrangements that we have until now. And now we have, let's say, make these things match. I think there is a lot of opportunity to um, a country like mine that basically it's going to jump into the possibilities of uh, carbon markets. Um, I think this is the the very like the very first step for for us to start changing our mindset. And by changing our mindset, I mean our private sector. Our private sector has um, has has credits, of course, from previous UNFCC um, mechanism and decisions from the past. But right now, I think this we have we are in the best moment to to for our private sector to start a voluntary uh, market and jump into the international carbon market itself. So a part of the fact that we were not, let's say, um, the happiest as country, a, a part of the group of countries with the overall outcome, we see Oh, hello, Natalie, can you hear us? You seem to have dropped out. Oh, um, we, yes, can you hear me? Yes, you're back. We can hear you again. Thanks. Okay. I think my connection is a little bit unstable. Can you hear me well now? Yep, we can hear you well. Okay, so overall, I think um, this is the perfect moment. Um, I mentioned before that we have a very, um, a very, uh, ambitious NDC for a small country. Our, um, our emissions are 0.06% of the whole world emission, uh, but uh, we are still in development. Um, and I think like right now, it's, it's the perfect moment to, to start this architecture of, financial, um, of the financial structure for climate change in our country with the commitment that we did that 7% of the, of the investment to reach our NDC needs to be national. So 5% is gonna be from uh, the private sector and 2% is gonna be fr from the government. Um, and that's challenging. That's something that our president needs to lead and he's com committed to do. He's been uh, committed to push forward uh, carbon neutrality for 20, 2050 which is very ambitious as well. And I think the only way we can reach that is engaging our private sector with carbon markets, both voluntary and voluntary basis uh, internally and also internationally. That's great. Thanks very much, Natalie. Sam, over to you. Yeah, and I think, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, when, when you look at the market, you take a step back, a huge majority of these projects without indigenous communities and without the involvement of indigenous communities, there is no project, there is no carbon offset, there are no uh, positive climate um, uh, you know, impacts. So it, it, is, it is a complete misnomer to ever really discuss this market without discussing the, ro the role of indigenous uh, communities. Um, and so when we look at the quality of projects, we're always looking at how, how, how are the projects um, interacting with and integrating with the local communities? How are they supported by the local communities? How are they supporting the local communities? All these sorts of questions are completely vital to understanding whether the project um, has been designed well, whether it has any chance of success and whether, you know, whether it is a just and, and a good project to be, to be supporting. So, you know, when you're looking at the quality of the offset um, or, or the project that you're looking to support, the, you know, the role of the indigenous communities um, in that project is always a key consideration to be looking at, if, if not the key consideration. Um, but quite apart from the climate impacts and the kind of climate integrity of those projects and, and, and those projects' uh, chance of success, it's really important uh, to many of our clients to be looking at the co-benefits that the projects offer. And, and, and a lot of our, in fact, almost all, uh, I'd actually go so far as to say all of our clients, um, are incredibly motivated by by the positive impacts of the, the projects, and they, they pay a very um, key you know keen eye to to looking at, at, at how those projects are supporting um, the roles of communities and the, the developments of, of communities' welfare. So yeah, no, I think um, COP did a great great job 
of, of, of highlighting um, the importance of that, uh, you know, that could always be improved on. But I do think uh, the role of indigenous communities was, was put forward at, at COP. And I think that's, you know, again, a great outcome uh, for the process. That's great, thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to turn a bit more now to the markets themselves. And Renee, you said a little bit earlier on about the, the fact that you see uh, supply falling a bit short of rising demand, at least in the short mm -hmm. term. But could you say a bit more about how you expect the, the market to respond to this and how you expect the supply demand dynamics to play out in, in the coming months? Yes, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> and. And maybe even picking up from, from the thread just previously around quality, I think that they're interlinked. So when we look at the ultimate end buyers, let's say the net zero you know, corporates, to echo Sam's comments, I, I think it's absolutely um, imperative, and, and many of them are already doing this through their public commitments, for them to support high quality projects, because ultimately this is a voluntary action and they're looking to engage with their key stakeholders, whether those be internal or external stakeholders. And so a key determining factor in them selecting the underlying units, the underlying offsets from specific projects is very much linked to, to these additional, what, what are traditionally references, co-benefits, right? So the climate, the biodiversity, and importantly, the community benefits that, that, that Sam just touched on. And, and so did Nat in terms of, in terms of like the, the holistic picture at the NDC level. When we look at, 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 at the project levels, these are really important determining factors. And the way that they are represented it are really best reflected by pricing. And so what, what we've seen is a couple of things that have really helped to shape the narrative, and, and this will kind of lead into the supply piece to answer your question, is um, uh, the first thing was for, for the market really needing to establish benchmarks. And, and we, as an exchange, have helped to facilitate that, working obviously with, with partners like S&P Platts and, and other price reporting agencies to help to address one of the key issues that, that Stephanie highlighted, the transparency issue around pricing, but also with regards to the supply component and, and then and the transactional volumes. Once of the benchmarks like, for example, the, the nature-based global emissions offset or NGO, were established, one of the core tenets of those of that contract, I should say, is, is to have an insistence on having those co-benefits -cert co certified, so via the CCB label. That then created the price signal essentially for those units. Everything that lacked that CCB essentially now had an incentive to go ahead and get it or sell at a discount. And then what's happened since then is through the work of, of, of Silvera and, and, and you know, I really commend your team, is the dissemination of even further qualitative differentiation around those projects. And so now there are projects that have really strong ratings at, at the Silvera level that actually now attract a premium above the market. So what that sets is an ambition for other project developers to really to pursue that price premium. So one is just the, the fundamental mechanics, right? Um, and, and then the other piece is that the floor in the market, the kind of the, the boogeyman in the industry that, you know, a lot of dissidents around the carbon markets have been harping on about for years is it, just no longer there. There's this, you know, pervasive notion that there's always been and will continue to be this oversupply of super cheap credits. That's just not factually correct. There's been so much activity in the market that all of that overhang has essentially been exhausted in the market. And the last wave essentially of that, and, and it's helped to sort of bring up the floor price, is the action of many crypto coins and, and other kind of you know crypto space, DeFi in particular, KlimaDAO, Toucan Earth, et cetera, that have effectively, effectively acted as a black hole or a sink for all of these really, um, you know, maybe not highest quality offsets and effectively taking them off the board. So now what that creates is, and to answer your question around supply, an incentive for the financial markets and the private sector actors to go ahead and implement new activities that reduce emissions at scale and can actually get the highest price premium. So there's this kind of lag that's occurring right now in terms of the investment, huge sums of money being you know, raised and now deployed in the in the upstream side of things, a project you know development. It'll take some time for those to actually be realised, and that will then spur further supply um, <clears throat> in the long run. Right, we're talking like a ten year, thirty year kind of horizon. In the short term, the supplies right now is constrained, and it's just a factor of essentially a number of financial asset managers all rushing in at once and effectively taking positions. If you do a deeper dive and you look at the analysis by Silvera 
which is fantastic on the project issuance versus retirement of units. Also, I would mean looking at Trove's research on this. There's a clear indication that there is sufficient supply out there. It's just sitting on the books of many of these kind of asset managers. I think that now that they've started to take positions, they'll now want to start rotating that portfolio and, and be able to provide off-take agreements to those corporates to be the natural kind of attrition of those offsets. And so there'll be this natural kind of pendulum swing back. Uh, I, I think that what, we're see, what we'll see, and this is a bit of a, a hypothesis, is that as we reach sort of December, a lot of the traders that have been long will start taking some profit and put, putting and providing liquidity into the market. So we'll see that kind of supply squeeze be alleviated a little bit. And in the new year, we'll start seeing more and more supply hitting the market. I think it's what, what we've seen now is this perfect kind of storm of increase in demand that kind of caught a lot of people off guard. And then the supply constraints that are just a phenomenon of the pandemic, like getting a VVB, a verifier and, and, and validator to a project site to actually do the monitoring on the ground has been problematic in, in a pandemic. So what that's also created is a need for essentially MRV 2.0 tools that can be leveraged by satellite and LIDAR and other drone, you know, like, you know satellite and, and imagery technologies to help to achieve a better and much more scaled picture of, of emission reductions. So there's this kind of lag, but but markets kind of go in those phases and we'll start seeing that, that supply constraint be alleviated. So. Again, hopefully that makes it sense. Thanks, Renee. Uh, that was fascinating, and there was really a lot in there. I'm, I'm particularly glad that you mentioned the rise of the the crypto actors in carbon markets because I think that's taken a few people by surprise, e even in the the last few weeks since <laughs> COP. Yeah, very um, much so. A, a lot of a lot of and, and to Stephanie's point, you know, there's a lot of corporates that are essentially coming into this, essentially, you know, green, let's say, and and there's a lot of sophisticated traders that were caught off guard. By the actions of a lot of these crypto kind of outfits i think that they that they were very um stealthy in terms of how they approach it and then they all came in really really quickly and they ate up the supply and i think that that's that's a positive for the market because now that downside risk for the asset managers is effectively gone um it, for the project developers it means that there's an incentive to go ahead and implement further higher quality and for corporates there's even a lesser risk that they're going to be challenged by NGOs and others around sourcing offsets that are dubious in nature. Essentially what's available is high quality and, and there'll be more and more of it. So I think it's a really good uh, service that they've done is effectively be the bottom feeders in the market and take out a lot of that older supply. Fascinating, Thank, thanks Renee, I, I love that. The crypto actors as the bottom feeders in the carbon market, hoovering up all the, the lowest quality supply from years gone by. Thanks, Ray. Really interesting. Okay, I'd like to quickly move on to a brief conversation about demand. So I'd like to ask Stephanie and then Sam, given that there is ever more and more capital and investment being allocated to the market, what risks and opportunities do you think this creates? It's a great question. Um, and I think Renee has honestly touched on a lot of this. So I'll just pull out, at least from our perspective, what we probably see as the biggest risk and opportunity. I think the opportunity with a lot of this money being funneled in is there's great opportunity that the projects and the locations that really need um, the carbon financing to protect areas or invest in low carbon decarbonization is getting it. I think that's very different from what we have seen in the past, um, definitely 10 years, but even in the past two years ago from now. So I think that's a huge opportunity. And I think the risk, which multiple people have kind of touched on, at least from the end user perspective, is the more visibility and the more focus there is on this, the more focus that there is to one and a half degrees on what we need to do, the more pressure I think there is to make sure we are doing everything right from a brand perspective, investing in the right projects, does it have the right social co-benefits, to biodiversity and all of those things. So, um, I think that is a potential risk just for the end user um, with things just moving so quickly, you know, what might be good one day is not, you, you know, you can be kind of ripped apart for it the next day. So ultimately, I think for end users, the risk there is being able to utilize the data that's out there, for example, from Silvera, from others to say, when, I make, when we're making decisions to push towards net zero, push towards decarbonization, we are doing it with the best information possible to make sure we're actually doing good across the board. 
Absolutely. Th thanks, Stephanie. Really interesting. So then, Sam, just building on that, if you could maybe say a, a bit more on, on the point of quality and specifically with the increase in demand and supply tightening, how do buyers pick the best projects that will ensure a return on their investments? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think as, as we've already touched on, but buyers are incredibly motivated by that, that, that piece on, on, on quality. And I think the really exciting thing about the market um, growing in this way and the, and the prices rising in this way means that, you know, I speak with developers very regularly and their eyes light up when they, when they talk about the prices, not, not out of greed, but out of, you know, the potential impact they can have, because, you know, with a, with a carbon price reaching $10, the types of projects that are now viable are incredible. They're, they're really, you know, it's, it's very exciting what this opens up in terms of the realms of, of possibility, but there still is a very heterogeneous market out there. Quality is on a spectrum. Um, and as we've touched on this in, in this panel, it is an incredibly complex area to try and navigate. Um, and many of the corporates that are making these net zero and, and uh, carbon neutral commitments uh, you know, many of these corporates aren't natives in this market. They don't have um, the necessary uh, specialism and, and expertise in house to execute well in a confusing and complex market, um, albeit one that the, has an incredible uh, potential for, for, for great impact, um, both the communities and climate. And so I think the really exciting thing about what, what we're doing at Silvera is essentially we're able to provide data uh, showing exactly uh, which are the best offsets, helping uh, corporate purchases understand where they should be directing their investments to have the, the, the most impact, but also to minimize the, the potential potential for reputational risk that, that can arise if, if, um, if, if that corporate investment potentially a, a, a poor quality offset. And so um, we're very passionate about the work that, that we're doing and, and we believe that we can really support, um, support corporates in, in making efficient and impactful decisions uh minimizing reputational risk that's great and thank you very much and on that note i'm afraid we're out of time so fascinating discussion clearly not the final word on uh, voluntary carbon markets in article six these are still live issues that are being debated and they will play out over the the months and potentially the years ahead but a really interesting time to reflect on what's happened at COP26 and since. So thanks again to all our four panelists. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Just while we're waiting for Ben to join, I might just kick off by answering um, Vitaly's question on uh, the new coming satellite solutions that are coming into the space. And yeah, I completely agree. Uh, that they present a cost-effective solution um, when compared to just traditional MRV. Um, but I think one of the challenges that's kind of emerging in this space is there's now a sort of proliferation of entities that are claiming to be able to produce these MRV solutions. Um, but the actual quality of, of the MRV that they're producing really, really varies. And I think particularly also there are questions around how the models that they're, they're building are calibrated. Um, so it's really important when you're when you're building a machine learning model that the, the, the data is properly calibrated and that the model is properly calibrated. So at the moment, the, the challenge is that the whole market, including the traditional MRV solutions, are using what we'd call um, allometry. Uh, so that's basically where you take fixed sample plots. Sometimes they vary, but usually it's fixed sample plots. And they measure the circumference of the trees uh, with a tape measure. And there'll be basic geometric models, which... Uh, look at the relationship between the size of a tree's trunk essentially and uh, the amount of biomass that's stored in that in that tree and then they'll use that data basically to estimate how much carbon is stored in that tree um, and they'll take a number of uh, samples per plot and they'll use that they'll extrapolate that to basically work how much work out how much uh, carbon is stored in um, each hectare um, of, of that forest type and that that data collection is very very varied in terms of its its quality it, it has systematic biases so it actually tends to underestimate the amount of carbon stored in the forest and so when you're looking at these like remote sensing mrv solutions the question is how are those models calibrated are they using basic allometry or are they using more advanced uh, calibration data sets how often do those models need to be calibrated and then what is the quality and the performance of those models so um i think 
you know, remote sensing first MRV is often presented as a, um, a bit of a kind of magic solution to the market, but actually there is a real variance in quality in those solutions. And so um, I think it's right that, that we look carefully at, at, at the standards that we adopt before we implement these, these models. Um, but in general, they, they have a, a huge part to play in the market. Um, and I think a really exciting thing that they open up is also a more quantitative way um, of testing the additionality and baselines of projects. And so, you know, in the Silvera methodologies, we use a huge amount of the geospatial data that we drive with our with our tech stack to actually test the quality of the the baselines of projects. Um, and so that you know, there's there's like a, a number of wins to be gained by using these these more advanced technologies because they can help give us assurance on the additionality and the baselines of the projects as well um, as giving a view on the the performance of the projects and the design of the projects. Um, I'm just looking through. Um, I, I oh, I can see a a, a, a um, a second question off the back of that to to bounce off the of Italy's question do you see new actors coming into the MRV space to compete with Vera at gold standard I don't see so, so essentially what gold standard and Vera are doing are they set methodologies so they're setting like frameworks uh, that then project developers and VVBs which are verification bodies um, then execute against so I don't see that MRV or new MLV players will be competing with with Vera or Gold Standard. It's more about whether Vera and Gold Standard adopt these technologies into their standards. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's not really a question of competition. It's around so basically evolution of these standards. And then also looking at the Article 6.4 mechanism, whether these new technologies will actually be adopted into adopted into these these new um, methodologies, which will need to be spun up under that that mechanism. So it's more about adopting those technologies into the, the current the current structures. Um, I think a really interesting thing and it's something that we're starting to work on is also about using these these data sets and the technologies we're building in and, and um, implementing them in national level monitoring. So, um, you know, looking at uh, national level inventories for, for carbon stocks in, in terrestrial sinks. Um, but let's just scooch back uh, to Dominic's question. But ben, that might be one for you, just talking about the, the different bodies that are, that are trying to help set and give some clarity around quality. Um, so you've got like the, the VCMI, you've got the, the governing body that was, that was set up off, off the back of the TSVCM recommendations. You've got the SBTI as well. Have you got any thoughts around you know, those different bodies. And I, I've also got some thoughts around like project level quality, but, but do you want to talk to that? Yeah, Dominic, it's, it's a great question. And um, I mean, the, the short answer is that the, the clue is in the name. It is voluntary. So it's always, I think, by definition, going to be a bit of a wild west. As the governments take more of an interest, as the VCMs start to resemble more and more the compliance markets, I think we're going to see governments starting to place some some rules around this and then it becomes a little bit less voluntary and a little bit more compliance and so ultimately the one decision maker will probably be the UNFCCC and prior to that individual governments setting their own kind of specific constraints as they do currently in the jurisdictions where VCMs are part of the compliance markets. I think another one to watch out for is the um, IFRS Foundation's ISSB. So this is the International uh, Financial Reporting Standards Bodies International Sustainability Standards Board. And this is the, the body that sets the rules for global accounting that almost every country follows, and they are looking to set up similar rules for sustainability reporting for corporates. They may end up deciding what type of claims can be made off the back of particular use of carbon credits. And, and that can then filter into the TSVCM and SBTI and um, VCMI and others. But I'm afraid there's there's no quick fix here. There is not going to be one body to rule them all because each body thinks that they should be the one to do that. But I think we are starting to see some, some coalescence, particularly around the CSVCM or the, the ICVCM as it's now been renamed and, um, and the VCMI, which are kind of two sides of the same coin. If you think about the distinction that they've made between ICVCM focusing on credit uh, supply and uh, VCMI focusing on credit demand. We could see a merger between those two, and I suppose that would be quite interesting, but ultimately it'll be for governments to decide, I think. Yeah, and I think um, that from our perspective, you know, we're seeing 
particularly on on the supply side and, and the, the high level principles around what quality looks like in terms of project quality and also at a jurisdictional level there seems to be increasing harmony around at a principles level what 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 makes a good offset so it needs to be additional uh, you need you know you need to have a sufficient uh, assurance on the quality of the MRV in terms of like the, the the monitoring of the performance of that offset but i think from our perspective those principles will only get you so far and you actually need a view on the the performance and the quality of any project at that at, at the project level um so it's not enough to kind of agree at a principles level you need to then actually have data on a project by project level to actually look at whether any whether each project is actually conforming to the principles that have set been set and agreed at that level and so that's why we're so passionate um about the work that we're doing because we believe that you know talking about principles will only get you so far and you actually need data at the project level to actually uh decide whether any particular offset conforms the principles that being but in, that have been set. And so it's, it's really, really important that you look at a project level um, so that you can pick the best offsets. So you can actually pick the offsets that conform to the, the principles that are being aligned on um, in these kind of high-level working groups. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm just uh, walking through. Um, ben, did you uh, see any other questions? Yeah, Sam, there's an interesting question here from Joe asking, do you see corporate buyers voluntarily adopting the 5% adaptation, 2% cancellation levies from Article 6 when buying off the VCM? I think that's a great question. What, what's your view, Sam? I mean, I, I haven't seen any um, haven't seen any discussion to the, this effect yet, but I guess Article 6 is still pretty hot off the press. I mean, in principle, I... I I could very much see that happening. I don't think, um, you know, it's very much within the spirit of of what a lot of the buyers that are engaged in the market are trying to achieve. And so, you know, I wouldn't be su surprised if, if something like that emerged. I haven't seen any, um, I haven't seen any initiatives to that effect. But, you know, uh, it, it probably wouldn't be too difficult to to affect. You just need a kind of agreement or a sort of coalescing of minds between the different exchanges that are that are emerging as the venues for these types of transactions. And you know that would be something really exciting uh, if it did occur, because I think that would be very much within the spirit of what the voluntary carbon market is is trying to achieve. And I think um, Article set Article Six sets a really great precedent there. Um, so I guess watch watch that space. Um, what do you think, Ben? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's definitely too early to tell, but um, I, I think that just as we have started to see a race to the top on credit quality in the last couple of years, and to the point where some companies are willing to spend over $300 a ton to invest in very novel technologies, I think we will also start to see a race to the top on discounts. And so for the moment, 7% is kind of the benchmark that was agreed in Glasgow, 5% for adaptation, 2% for... Um, overall mitigation. I, th I think we will start to see some of the, the the top end of the market trying to outbid each other on what type of discount they're applying. And that's that's a really interesting development. And it kind of ties in, I suppose, with some, some of the ratings that you're seeing where some projects are massively overachieving on their carbon impact, um, sometimes a very significant multiple. And that's also something that you'll start to see um, priced into the market more and more. So another question here, Sam, from Camilla, which is about how you see the incorporation of removals technologies, particularly on, on the standard and the accounting rules. Yeah, so I, you know, already seeing removals methodologies being spun up by the voluntary carbon market um, bodies. So I, I've seen a number of drafts being spun up. Um, in honesty, it's it's actually from from an accounting perspective, it's it's fairly simple to incorporate these types of technologies into the into the kind of like um government level accounting um and the methodologies in theory are are fairly simple to spin up although you need to be careful when you look at the life cycle analysis particularly of these sort of mvp plants um but you know i see i see these these types of um technologies being incorporated into the voluntary carbon market ecosystems quite quite simply and i think the corresponding adjustments again um once there are national level um mechanisms in place i think they'll slot fairly easily in um just by nature of the the, the type of technologies you're speaking about there so I, I don't see these as particularly complex that when you're looking at removals technologies that the onus is much more on like getting them to scale and getting them to, 
to the point where they're efficient and, and deployable at scale, uh, which is obviously a huge challenge. That's great. Thanks very much, Sam. And I'm sorry that we didn't have time to answer everyone's questions. Got some good questions there from Farid and, and Thibaut that we didn't have time for. Apologies, but do do follow up um, and, and we hope to be able to tackle those issues offline. So thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you to future conversations about carbon markets, nature-based solutions and net zero pathways in the coming months. Thanks a lot for joining and wishing you all a great day wherever in the world you are. Bye for now. Thank you.